Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all very much for coming out to today's lecture. It's always a privilege to be at the Honolulu Museum of Art, where I actually started my museum career many years ago in the early 1970s. And it's always really delightful to come back. So thank you all very much for coming. I'm glad to see that Doris Duke, Shangri-La, and Islamic art can still draw a good crowd. Special thanks to the Honolulu Museum of Art for showing Doris Duke Shangri-La Architecture, Landscape, and Islamic Art, and particularly to Stefan Yost, the director, and Sean Eichmann and their team. We think the exhibition looks better here than it has in any of the other six previous venues. We're really delighted to have it here and also happy to have it home. So thank you all, Sean, wherever he's gone to. I <laughs> see him behind the pole. Okay, so let's talk a little bit. Um, I'm going to be speaking, as, as Sean alluded today, about Doris Duke's creation of Shangri-La in the late 1930s. As she noted in an article that she wrote for Town and Country Magazine in 1947, quote, it isn't the product of any one person, but of a number of architects and decorators from all over the world, finally put together by me. Today, I'd like to trace the role of some of the major contributors to the shaping of Shangri-La, including Doris herself, and explore how inspirational travels and a growing collection of Islamic art prompted periodic rethinks and renovations. Shangri-La was truly the work of a lifetime, conceived by her at the age of 23 and a project in which she was still deeply engaged up until her death at the age of 80. First, a little background. This is by now an oft-told and familiar story to many of you. Doris Duke, the only child of James Buchanan Duke and his second wife, Natalie Holt Inman Duke, who together with his brother Benjamin formed the American Tobacco Company and also Duke Power, which still operates today. Long before her birth, he had amassed two large fortunes, and on the occasion of her birth in New York City on November 22, 1912, the New York Times ran a front page article with the headline, The Richest Girl in the World, The Million Dollar Baby. This is a name that stuck with her for the rest of her life, and it was the, she was the subject of constant media attention and scrutiny. The central tragedy of her young life was her father's death in 1925, when Doris was just 12. His primary heirs were Doris and the Duke University Endowment. Shy, independent, and fiercely private, she spent much of her life trying to pursue her own interests while avoiding the public spotlight. She was educated at the Brearley School in New York City and finished her last year of high school at a private girls' school in South Carolina. Here, noted photographer Cecil Beaton captured her youthful glamour and hinted at the social demands and expectations of her class and wealth. As a young woman, she participated in the expected rituals, coming out as a debutante in 1930, being presented to the King and Queen of England, and the summer social world in Newport, Rhode Island. When she turned 21, the throngs outside the family home on East 78th Street in New York were so thick that she fled to their country home, Duke Farms in New Jersey, with her mother and her half-brother Walker Inman for a quiet dinner. In February 1935, at the age of 22, Doris married James Cromwell, 15 years her senior, a divorcee with a young daughter, handsome, worldly, and not afraid of media attention. They embarked immediately on a honeymoon tour around the world. Their travels took them to Palestine, Jordan, and Egypt, and then to India, where they spent two months traveling in the north of the subcontinent. For Doris, India is a turning point. The this photo of her at the Moti Mosque in Delhi captures the moment of encounter with the crisp line and the forms of Mughal architecture and the warm play of light on marble and stone. It is in India where she makes her first purchases of Islamic art, jade objects with inlaid stone, Central Asian Suzani's embroideries, carpets, 
and metalwork. From Agra, her husband wrote that Doris, quote, has fallen in love with the Taj Mahal and all of the beautiful marble tile with their lovely floral designs and precious stones. Inspired by the Taj Mahal and other monuments of Mughal architecture in India, Duke and Cromwell returned to Delhi and commissioned noted British architect Francis Blomfield, who's shown here at left, to design a marble bedroom and bathroom suite, which would eventually become the nucleus of the not yet conceived Shangri-La. Blomfield prepared designs, of which this is one, for marble panels with inlaid stonework, jollies or perforated screens, and other marble features based on those at the Taj Mahal and the Red Fort in Delhi. The work was actually executed by the Indian Marble Works in Agra, who unfortunately we have no photographs of. They are specialists in marble inlay and stone carving and have been um, craftsmen working in these traditions for many generations. This is the first instance of Duke turning to designers and master craftsmen to commission new work inspired by historical buildings and monuments in Muslim countries, a practice that she would continue in order to build Shangri-La and which we'll be looking at more examples of today. With the Marble Commission underway, the Cromwells departed India, continued to Indonesia, Southeast Asia, China, and Japan, and sailed into Honolulu Harbor on August 29th, 1935. Struck by the island's natural beauty and the relaxed outdoor lifestyle, they extended their planned two-week stay and lingered for four leisurely months, renting a cottage on Black Point Road, not far from where Shangri-La is today. At the Royal Hawaiian Hotel on the beach at Waikiki, the Cromwells quickly fell into the company of the extended Kahanamoku family, and a small circle of local friends. With them, Duke learned to surf and also joined them in paddling canoes, sailing. And here she is at the start of a canoe race, crewing with three of the brothers, that's Sarge in the lead, Bill with the white cap, and Sam at the rear. The Kahanamoku Ohana formed the nucleus of her social circle for many years, gathering often to enjoy Hawaiian music, tag football and beach picnics. They introduced Doris to contemporary Hawaiian culture of the late 1930s and shared the relaxed outdoor lifestyle which she loved. And just to get you um, identified here, this is Louis Kahanamoku and his wife Viola Sims, Sarge and his wife Anna Furtado Kahanamoku who becomes a very close friend of Doris and Sam Kahanamoku. This is picnicking at um, Mokapu Peninsula with um, Pyramid Rock in the background there. Um, Bernice Kahanamoku, who I, is the surviving Kahanamoku's sister, and Doris. Sam, don't know who this is. This is Marion Pascal. Um, Doris is very close confidant and secretary who always travels with her. Um, I think this is Viola Sims and Lewis, and we don't know who this is until someone locally tells us, and <laughs> we'll be happy for that information. And here, um, hanging out with the Lester Marks family out at Makua on the west side. Um, Lester Marks, Marion Pascal, um, Doris's secretary, Lee Loy Marks, and their daughter, Tita Stack, who as many of you know, um, Anna Furtado Kahanamoko and her husband, Sarge, Doris, Sam, and the ever-present Johnny Gomez, who um, met Doris the first day she arrived in Hawaii and um, was still living at Shangri-La when she passed away in 1980. And, uh, unfortunately, I missed him by about a year. Never met him. It was Sam Kahanamoku who showed Doris the 4.9-acre property at Ka'alawai, which she bought from Ernest Wodehouse in April 1936 to build her Honolulu home. Soon thereafter, she hired an American architect, Marion Sims Wyeth, on the left, and began working with him to design a home that would marry her new love of Islamic art and architecture with Hawaii's tropical landscape. In this obviously staged photo, here is Wyeth on the left, Anna Furtado Kahanamoku in the middle, 
And on the right, supervising architect Drew Baker, who was on site throughout the construction. Wyeth was born in New York, trained at Princeton and the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, and as a young man, worked for Bertram Goodhue, who later designed the Honolulu Academy of Arts. In 1919, he established his own office in Palm Beach, Florida, and designed mainly private residences for well-to-do clients in a remarkable variety of styles, from colonial revival to Mediterranean revival to modernist. As Donald Albrecht and Tom Mellons, the guest curators for the exhibition, have noted, quote, Wyeth falls within the tradition of the society architect, who tend not to develop a single signature style, but rather delve into many different ones, often derived from the specific environmental and architectural conditions of place. Working with their clients, society architects also tend to be willing to cede total aesthetic control of a project. While these qualities help explain why Wyeth is not more widely known, they also underscore why this self-effacing architect proved an ideal choice to work with the strong-willed and opinionated Doris Duke, end quote. And I want you to remember Do Drew Baker over here on the right, because we're going to be talking more about his contributions to Shangri-La soon. Wyeth's early conceptual drawings for Shangri-La from 1936 are on an astonishingly grand scale. Massive, monumental, absolutely Cecil B. DeMille-like in its ambitions. This is not what Doris wanted. She did not need a house upon a hill for all the world to see, but rather a secluded retreat nestled into terraces surrounded on three sides by dense vegetation and fronting the expansive Pacific. Wyeth and Baker's arrival in Honolulu in February 1937 and meeting with their clients, Duke and Cromwell, served to reduce the scale and the volume of the buildings and to simplify the design. As we can see in this photo from the end of the summer of that year, it shows the essential spareness and clean modernism of the design as the house evolves into what is essentially a blank palette upon which Doris could apply Islamic elements. And that is what she's going to proceed to do, as we'll see. With construction underway, the Cromwells departed in May 1937 on a two-month trip to Europe, and including one week in Morocco. Photographs and film footage in Morocco confirmed that they were enchanted by the traditional architecture with its white facades, tile work, rooftop pavilions, and gardens. In Rabat, they placed their second large commission, this time with the firm Salam René Martin for custom architectural and decorative features. Here, a malam, or a master, with one of the workshops that produced the work, poses behind a section of the balustrade that ends up in Shangri-La's foyer, and also the doors that ornament the exterior of the Moroccan room, um, which you would see if you're at the sh upper lawn at Shangri-La, and which originally served as James Cromwell's bedroom. The Cromwell ordered a wide variety of materials from Martin, including two large ceilings for the foyer and the living room, details shown here, doors which frame the east end of the living room, which you see all the way to the right, plaster friezes, archways, and colored glass windows. He also proposed some interior design schemes, which you see in this drawing for the living room at the center. And many of these proposals were actually adopted in the earliest furnishing plans for the living room. Uh, a little bit later, I'll show you a black and white photo of the first arrangement of the living room, and you can see how closely it follows this layout. And then on the left, you see three of the people engaged in the actual execution of the commission, and whose names are still unknown. And we're very excited. We have a young scholar who is currently in Morocco on a Fulbright coming out in August. She's a specialist in this period and has done work on Martin and his workshop. So we're hoping that we learn more about the background and perhaps some of the individuals in the workshops that actually produced this work. Martin's workshop is clearly one of the major design influences on the development of the house and the display of the collection. 
in the foyer, the ceiling, plaster frieze of colored glass windows, and the enormous wood grill that shields us from the central courtyard are key elements in creating a stunning impression on the visitor and defining a strong sense of place. On the right, the living room shows off one of the most defining features of the house, wood screens that fold or retract into the wall, allowing the room to either be closed and interiorized, as shown here, or to be completely open to the outdoors, like an open air pavilion. By the end of 1937, the Cromwells were planning another trip, a six week tour of the Middle East, including Iran, to visit and document more historical monuments, to research design ideas, and to purchase collections for Shangri-La. They turned to Arthur Upham Pope, who stands here. Here he is with his, his team that is involved in surveying historical monuments in Iran. Um, no relation, by the way. They turned to him for help with planning their trip and providing introductions to dealers and others who could facilitate their work. Pope, an American art historian, was founder and director of the American Institute for Persian Art and Archaeology, leader of its expeditions in Iran, and organizer of international exhibitions promoting Persian art. He is shown here with his team, as I've already mentioned. A lot has been made of Pope's influence on Duke and the design of Shangri-La. He was certainly invaluable in arranging their itinerary, transportation, food, and making essential contacts with key people. But his influence was not a lasting one, to his considerable disappointment. As he wrote to Duke's accountant, Lee Baldwin, in New York, quote, I hope you will understand when I say that I have been a little anxious about the plans for the house. I have had considerable architectural experience, and I know better than most the difficulties of the undertaking, how easy and serious to fall short of magnificent opportunities and to invite real disappointment. Persian architectural ornament can be successfully adapted to a modern residence, but not if the problem is underestimated. I am sure the Cromwells have an architect who is competent, no doubt brilliant, but the most brilliant architect cannot manage the assimilation of Persian ornamental detail or a thousand little subtleties that convey the quality and poetic charm of Persian architecture. It can only be done by someone who has studied the architecture on the spot, who has flexible mindedness to adjust himself to the Eastern idiom. Let me know if these suggestions come within the proprieties. I believe the Cromwells have a chance not merely to do something wholly delightful for themselves, but that will be a real contribution. Alas, Pope's suggestions did not fall within Duke's proprieties. She was not interested in giving him a larger role in the project. And while the trip would have been impossible without him, his lasting contribution was the very wonderful Mary Crane, shown here, a graduate student at New York University's Institute of Fine Arts and Pope's field assistant on several of their architectural surveys in Iran. She accompanies the Cromwells on their trip in Iran in March and April of 1938 and continues to advise Duke really up until the outbreak of World War II. Here is Cromwell in the center with Mary Crane on the right and their guide in Egypt. For several years, she played a critical role in helping Duke build her collections of Islamic art, researching, advising, and scouring the marketplaces in the Middle East and later in New York. The Cromwell's intention in Iran was to see and document historical monuments and architectural ornament and to research tiles for Shangri-La. They visited numerous sites and cities, filmed and photographed extensively, but nowhere more closely than the 17th century Shah Mosque here in the central square of Isfahan. This was at Pope's strong encouragement. He had photographed and even recreated it for exhibitions in Philadelphia and London, and it had also recently been restored and was looking quite presentable. 
Careful observation and recording of architectural and decorative detail built the Cromwell's own knowledge and confidence and also laid the groundwork for a third commission of new work to integrate into Shangri-La. Here's a clip of some of the actual um, film footage that they shot of the facade of the Shahd Mosque. It's a short one and I think it's already repeating itself. Gives you some idea of how detail and what long, slow, careful panning they did in, throughout the, the trip in Iran to document these historical structures. Through Pope, they met Ayub Rabanu, shown here at the center in the coat, an art dealer based in Tehran and also in Paris. In Isfahan, they contracted with him for a very large body of custom tile work. Surrounded by his workshop of tile makers, from young apprentices to older master craftsmen in a photo that he sent to Duke to show her evidence of progress on the commission. And judging from the visual evidence in front of us, it looks like they are actually working on the commission um, for Doris Duke. We can recognize and identify these individual tile pieces. Another photo from the same series dated March 1939 show craftsmen at work on the grills for Shangri-La's central courtyard, and I've inserted actually one of those grills which are way up high in the patio. Um, notes on the reverse of the photos identify the older gentleman in the center as the master of mosaic tile making, although it doesn't give his name. He and the many individuals involved in this large and well-documented commission also remain to be identified. This massive mosaic tile panel made by the Isfahani workshop that we've just seen and patterned after one at Isfahan Shah Mosque dominates the south wall of the central courtyard at Shangri-La and demonstrates the profound contribution these tile makers made to creating a sense of place. Their tiles enliven the facade of the playhouse the exterior of the living room portico, the arched doorways facing the central courtyard, and the east wall of the dining room. The scale, brilliant colors, and patterns of the tiles play a major role in establishing Shangri-La's aesthetic. There was a method to her madness in keeping the house design simple, restrained, and modernist, as we saw in that early construction photo. The Moroccan commissions, the tiles commissioned in Isfahan, and the antique ceramic tiles that Duke purchased in Iran on this same trip in 1938 and continued to acquire for the balance of her life become the surface ornament that animates the purposely blank walls of the house, inside and out. And now, more about Mary Crane and her contributions to Shangri-La. One of the places she and Cromwell visited and documented was the Chahul Satun, a royal pavilion built in 1647, also facing the Maidan or the main square in Isfahan. They took detailed photographs and Crane hunted down historical descriptions, engravings, and drawings of the structure showing detailed roof patterns, columns, and capitals. They sent these to Wyeth, the architect, and directed him to use it as the model for the playhouse, Duke's guest house at Shangri-La. On the left is the actual Chahul Satun with its reflecting pool, and here the playhouse with its 75-foot-long saltwater swimming pool, which I trust most of you have seen, and you can see it's a, um, a creative but still fairly um, respectful adaptation. A few months after the trip to Iran, Doris asked Mary Crane to research the appropriate color for the columns for the playhouse for two reasons. One, the original colors of the Chahul Satun had been lost, faded, or improperly restored over the last 300 years. And two, Doris planned to add something to the facade of the tile that is not typical of the Chahul Satun, and that is new tiles that she had commissioned in Isfahan, which we've already talked about, and you see them in the photo here. She wants to be sure that the color of the columns works with the tiles. And Mary Crane writes to her, Dear Lahi Lahi, which was her Hawaiian name, which means um, delicate or fragile. It's what the Kanamoku family called her. So here's Mary Crane speaking. 
I've been going into the column situation by a miniature painting, which, by the way, was an excellent suggestion. I foresee a great future for you as a graduate student. From the 15th century on, there are two favorite ways of treating the columns. The first is the natural wood, which is awfully good against the tile backgrounds. The other, I blush to say, is a solid Chinese red. Although I found no examples in large architectural structures, it is a favorite color for fences, for tent poles, and for the slender columns of small pavilions, such as we have here. The effect together with the tile backgrounds and the bright colors is quite striking. I had thought that it might kill the colors of the tile, but on contrary, it seems to bring out their brilliance. Your porch, at any rate, is quite deep, so wouldn't the depth plus the shadow serve to separate the tiles sufficiently from the red so that they would complement one another, which, as Mary Crane hoped, they do. Mary Crane was also largely responsible for negotiating many of Duke's most valuable acquisitions during the most intense period of collecting, 1938 to 1940, including the extraordinary mirab or prayer niche from Veramin, Iran, shown here on the left, framed by the Moroccan doors and then a detail on the right. Standing nearly 13 feet high, signed by the master artist Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Tahir and dated 1265 AD, it is a masterpiece and one of only six surviving mirabs from this peak of Persian luster production in the 13th century. Crane negotiated with the New York-based dealer Hagop Kevorkian throughout the summer of 1940 on Duke's behalf, while Kevorkian also entertained proposals from the curator of New Eastern Art at the Metropolitan Museum. In the fall, Kevorkian wrote to Doris that he was, quote, bending under the pressure of the persistent efforts of Miss Crane. But truly, I was not happy over it until I met you in New York. I'm now confident that the mirab is to be set up in a sympathetic atmosphere and shall be preserved for the benefit of posterity under your wise and appreciative direction. It's a very flattering dealer indeed. <laughs> With the outbreak of the war, Crane's marriage and Duke's posting abroad to work for the U.S. Siemens Service, Crane's work for Duke wound down, although they remained friends and in touch for many years. Meanwhile, back at Shangri-La, Drew Baker, the supervising architect who I introduced earlier, was busy translating Duke's vision for the playhouse into reality. Throughout the design and construction phase, it is chiefly Baker who is responsible for taking Duke's evolving ideas and the commissioned art and architectural elements from Morocco and Iran and integrating them into the plans for Shangri-La. This charming sketch by Baker for the playhouse, red columns and all, shows how adeptly he absorbed the Cromwell's 1938 trip to Iran, the film and the photographs, and the research by Mary Crane. A graduate of Princeton School of Architecture, Baker, shown up here on the roof in one of many photographs documenting the progress of the construction, remained in Honolulu throughout the design and construction. His many drawings and renderings show how closely he was involved in incorporating Duke's ideas, among them different styles of arches, columns, and capitals, and even an on-the-spot design for a rooftop pavilion made of the marble jollies or perforated screens that had broken in transit from India. And here's a little clip of him escorting Doris through the construction. There he is, isn't he cute? <laughs> A few examples of how Baker worked with Doris to incorporate ideas and materials gathered on her travels and research. On the left, a photograph she sent him of massive doorways in the ancient city of Persepolis, Iran, that she visited in 1938. And on the right, at her direction, Baker adapted the design for the treatment of the living room exterior doors. Persepolis also served as the inspiration for the columns, the capitals, and the frieze at the dining room lanai elegantly captured in this color sketch by Baker, dated August 1938. And as you can see in the dated photograph below, it's up and in place by January 1939. 
The arrival of the marble screens commissioned in India brings the unwelcome surprise that the screens have broken in transit. Duke collects the insurance and commissions a new set for the bedroom suite and charges Baker with designing the rooftop pavilion and incorporating the broken jolly. And you see his sketch for that and also the realized end result. He is also tasked with designing the arched and mirrored ceiling in Duke's dressing room, which just opened in October along with the rest of the bedroom suite that was commissioned in India. In September of 1930, inspired by mirrored ceilings that she had actually seen on her travels in Iran and had also filmed and photographed, in September of 1938, Baker wrote to Doris, anxious about her pending arrival for Christmas. The most important thing inside the house as far as time is concerned is your dressing room. There's an awful lot of drawing on it to get the curves of the various arches and penetrations right. And looking at those drawings, you can see what he's talking about. And the metal work that carries the plaster has to be bent accordingly and then lathed and then plastered all before we can begin to stick the mirror on. It all has Davis and Sousa so worried that they have asked me to concentrate on the details of this room at the expense of everything else. As you can see, Baker was an essential partner to Duke in realizing her ambition for a modern and comfortable house that successfully integrates Islamic architectural elements. The Cromwells move into the main house on Christmas Day of 1938. Baker finishes miscellaneous details in early 1939, and Duke continues to make adjustments and full-scale renovations to parts of the house over the course of her lifetime to accommodate her growing collections. This is the earliest photograph we have of a detail of the living room. The layout owes a lot to that early sketch by Rene Martin in Morocco, which we looked at earlier with the placement of the divans this is one of his um, epigraphic wood panels, um, and obviously his screens and the ceiling up here, but even these are things that he created for her. The following photos show how new acquisitions prompted renovations and rethinking of the house. In 1941, Duke purchased a number of items for the Will Randolph Hearst collection, including the Spanish tile shown here above the fireplace and detailed at left. 236 tiles are joined in pairs to form one design unit. The first installation shows them running up the wall vertically to create a fireplace mantle. Soon thereafter, she purchased a historic Spanish fireplace mantle, also formerly in her um, collection, and bought from the Gimbel Brothers sales in New York. The mantle prompted another transformation of the living room, as you can see here. The Spanish lusterware tiles were deinstalled and placed horizontally to flank the fireplace on either side, and several Spanish lusterware ceramics were hung to complement the ensemble. This third solution worked to Duke's satisfaction and remains in place today. At the east end of the living room is an arched doorway that opens onto a room which links the living room and the dining room today called the Mirab Room. Originally, Duke placed a Chinese Ming Dynasty sculpture of the Bodhisattva Guan Yin, which you see here, in this very architecturally significant space. In 1940, she purchased the Mirab, and recognizing it as the most significant piece in her collection, she placed it in this prominent location and sent the Guan Yin to her house at Duke Farms in New Jersey. Following her death, it was donated to the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, where you can see it today, a much prized piece. Still talking about renovations and transformations. The original dining room had a marine motif shown in the black and white photos at left. Fronting the ocean, it featured glass balls hung from nets as lighting devices, built-in saltwater aquariums, coral, shells, and furniture with sea motifs. In the 1960s, when Duke was well into her 50s, she transformed the dining room into a tented interior. With applique, textiles from Egypt and India hanging here, and they also would have hung here, um, the legs of an Indian bed converted to make a table, 
The centerpiece is a Baccarat chandelier made circa 1840, specifically for export to the Middle East and to India. And then on the east wall, one of the um, big mosaic tile commissions that had been commissioned in um, Iran in, on that 1938 trip. The tenting of the dining room is not a new idea. Doris Duke had a long-term fascination with tented interiors, and the original installation of the playhouse is actually has a tented ceiling and also used Suzani's, which were sometimes hung in the interior of tents as a wall element. Um, so the, the realization of the dining room, which you see here on the right, um, is finally her kind of coming home and creating a, a tented interior that worked, that she actually lived in and enjoyed and kept in place throughout her death. She, I mentioned her long-term fascination. She um, commissioned a tent from dealers that she worked with in Damascus. Um, she also acquired additional tent, applique tent panels similar to the ones hanging in the dining room, which are still in the collection, but we have no record of them actually being used. At the age of 52, in the midst of renovating her dining room, Duke had a clear vision for the future of Shangri-La as a place with educational value and importance beyond that of her private home and a personal collection. It was during this time period that she first introduced a codicil to her will defining a future for Shangri-La. Hannah Veery, mother of the beloved local singer Emma Veery, was one of Duke's very close friends and confidants and also one of the witnesses to the 1965 codicil to the will. The will directs her executor to organize the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art upon her death to manage and maintain Shangri-La for the study and understanding of Islamic art and culture. 30 years before her death, Duke already had a clear vision of the relevance of the property and the architecture and the importance of her collections. And this, by the way, is a photo of Nana Viri and Doris in Thailand. Um, incidentally, Nana Viri served as the director of one of Duke's foundations, the Southeast Asian Art Collection, which was, unfortunately, she never was able to um, get it set up here in Hawaii, and so it was sent back to New Jersey and then eventually donated to many museums following her death. The Syrian room on the right, installed in the early 80s, is more display than living space, evidence of a shift in Duke's thinking of Shangri-La as a personal retreat and sanctuary towards a place for exhibition and study. It is one of the most ambitious of the renovations she made to Shangri-La. The impetus was her acquisition of elements from a 19th century painted interior from Damascus, purchased largely from the Kevorkian Center for Near Eastern Studies at NYU, the same Kevorkian from whom she purchased the Mirab in 1940, composed of carved and painted wood panels, doors and niches, inlaid stone blocks, marble floor tiles and other large architectural fragments. Installing it required major structural renovations, including removal of the billiards room on the left, a bathroom and office to raise the ceiling and lower the floor. The Syrian room evokes reception rooms in affluent courtyard homes in the old city of Damascus during the 18th and 19th century. It faces onto the courtyard as it would have in its country of origin, but it deliberately isolates itself from ocean views that characterize the rest of Shangri-La to better suggest the experience of the old city. It is closer to a museum period room than anything else in the house, and indeed Duke used it lightly occasionally entertaining guests here for after dinner drinks, but primarily engaged with the room as a place for display rather than living in. She spent nearly 60 years creating and embellishing Shangri-La, the place, and the collections of Islamic art. And for nearly half of that time, it was with an eye towards its eventual public opening. Following Doris Duke's death in 1993 at the age of 80, her several foundations came into being, including the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art, which was organized and took ownership of the property by the end of 1997. Our initial challenge was to prepare this fiercely private place to open to the public. Cataloging of the collections began in 1999, 
along with early conservation efforts and major physical repairs began in 2001, and Shangri-La first opened to the public in November of 2002. Since that initial opening, Shangri-La has evolved as a center for learning about Islamic arts and culture, as Duke wished, through exploration of the house and collections, performances of music, dance, and poetry, an inspiring and neutral space for dialogues, meetings, and convenings, such as you see at left, with a wide variety of local and national partners. We offer residencies to scholars to study and publish the collections, which prior to our public opening were little known. On the left, textile expert Raul Jain of Delhi and, conserv and conservator, textile conservator Anne Svensson examine an extremely rare 17th century Indian tent panel. And on the right, scholars specializing in 19th century Persian art, Ladan Akbarnia of the British Museum and independent scholar Leila Deba decipher a Persian manuscript. We host artists working in a wide array of media, including calligraphers, poets, musicians, dancers, filmmakers, and people working with new media. And we're thrilled that some of these people will actually be part of the program series that is being presented here at the Academy, at the museum, during the run of this show. Um, all in some way engaged with and responding to the site, the house, and the collections. And from here left to right, Muhammad Zakaria, the noted American calligrapher who specializes in Ottoman style calligraphy, Hassan Alahi, who works in a variety of media, and Kehan Kalhor, very noted um, musician who often plays with the Silk Road Project. At a time when all things Islamic are increasingly misunderstood and tested and debated, our purpose is to bear witness to the beauty of Islamic arts and culture, as artist Shazia Sikander has done here in this glorious projection of her imagery onto Shangri-La's buildings and landscapes. And you will see this in the exhibition along with other of her projections. To provide a place for artistic expression, here, Afru's Amigis, Rocket Gods, which comments on the juxtaposition of an Islamic-style palace with a significant military presence in the islands and incursions overseas. To inspire people to find something of themselves, here, artist Ayad Al-Qadi, who will speak here next week, highly recommended, and his painting, I Am Baghdad. And this is Ayad, quote, to me, Shangri-La is proof that beauty can travel beyond cultural and historical context. It can find a new home and adopt a new identity that is independent from its original references, yet very much still part of the motherland that created it. As an artist, I have been moved by themes of immigration and displacement, crossing cultural, religious, and political borders, yet maintaining the core values an appreciation of one's heritage and culture is a profound topic that affects all immigrants. And above all, to find inspiration and joy, as Doris did on her travels and in creating Shangri-La, and as we hope people continue to today. And I will end with jazz trumpeter Amir El Safir and Ikla Hussein Khan, sitar master, collaborating and performing in the Syrian room.
Thank you all very much. I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Question, no, Stefan. <laughs> this will be provocative. How is your perception of Tango Law changed from when you started to today? Well, you know, I, great question. Thank you. Um, you know, I really spent most of my life working in historic houses, um, and I've always been really fascinated and engaged at the intersection of um, place and home and people and material objects. And the first time I saw Shangri-La, first of all, um, when I was in conversation with the foundation, I was not interested. I actually told them I'm not interested. I'm not interested in lifestyles of the rich and famous. And then I went down and they opened the door and I walked in and you know I did the same thing everybody does when they walk into the general law. They were like, wow. And I, I literally stopped and I put my purse down and said, oh, okay. Um, forget what you think you know about Doris Duke. We're, we're going to learn about and discover her through what she's assembled here. Um, Clearly today, my, my perspective on Shangri-La is very different. I mean, you can tell from my talk, I'm still very engaged with that intersection of place and home and person and, and material things. But at this point in time, we have a much larger mission. Um, her challenge to promote the study and understanding of Islamic art couldn't be more visionary couldn't be more contemporary, couldn't be more um, critical. And that's the challenge we've had to rise to. And um, that's really what most of our programs are about. We do scholarly programs that focus on the collection, but bringing artists, having convenings, having dialogues there, keeping our eye on the fact that um, having a, a a bigger understanding of, of what the Islamic world is really about as opposed to what we read in the papers every day is uh, an extraordinary social mission for any nonprofit, um, much less a historic house museum to have. And, and I am deeply grateful for that every day. I mean, every day we try to fulfill that mission and it's not an easy one. <laughs>